The greatest trick Colby Donaldson ever pulled was convincing the world he was just a Superman in a fat suit. He got slammed by the Dragon Slayer, picked up and brought in the van. Today he got beat by a cripple and a fat dude on an obstacle course. It's like finding out Superman was in the big girdle. You see the muscles and you get up close and there's nothing but a fat suit. I mean, hearing that's certainly not as bad as living it. You know, that's the worst. I mean, it's a reality. It's a reality. Up to this point, I have not performed as well as I would have hoped to. Internet Survivor is an incredibly complicated game with a multitude of variables to account for, many of them probably for the worse, either getting in your way of outlasting all of the other players, if not outright hurting your chances of winning, and the cherry on top is that you likely have no control over most of them. It's kind of understated and not talked about very often, but there's a lot of luck to finding success. But thankfully, the game is not entirely based on just that. Otherwise, we'd be opening covered boxes to see who gets eliminated next. Imagine being in that timeline. Oh. The tactics we use to create fortuitous opportunities and maximize our luck is what we call strategy. Like the scholar Brandon Hance once said, we fight ever onward against the gods, pulling the strings as we attempt to be the authors of our own fate. In other words, uh, we have to do our best to control as much as we can to ensure we give ourselves the best odds to win. Any little bit helps, and in this case, we are talking about the concept of sandbagging. Bags? of sand. It feels like a uh, bag of sand. Bag of sand? You know what I mean. Why don't we just play? For those out of the loop, back in the late 1800s, what we today call old school survivor, people used to fill up bags of sand and sneak up on one another and beat them with said bag. It's a fact, it's a proven fact. Google it. I'm not even sure what the context was for those beatings, but I figured I would just mention it because it's the first thing that comes up on Google. In order to know where we're going, we have to know where we've been. But in more modern times, especially in sports, sandbagging is a strategy where you act and behave worse than you actually are in order to get your opposition to believe you're actually just that bad. The simple idea here is that by failing to excel in the challenges, I have lowered how threatening I might be to everyone else. If I was a really strong guy who by appearances should be good at a bunch of athletic stuff, which obviously in real life I am, and then I begin to bomb at all of those athletic things, which of course in real life I never would, you might not worry as much about me once we get to the individual portion of the game. Everyone at every point in time in the game is a threat to some degree, and a large part of Survivor is about figuring out who is the most threatening and ensuring they don't get to the end. Unless you're the most threatening, in which case you need to then learn to cast a spell over everyone to convince them otherwise. Starting with sandbagging. If need be, a viable tactic that's been used since the early days of the show to make players appear less worthy of being voted out, possibly buying them more time down the line. Many players throughout the many seasons have done the opposite. I would wager more players don't sandbag than do, largely because if you do choose to play down your abilities, you might also lose a challenge and actually get voted out, which is the worst thing that can happen. There's a risk versus reward element with this strategy. If you appear too weak, it won't matter how strong you really are because Oftentimes, perception is reality. Sandbagging is a selfish tactic that will hurt your tribe in the tribe portion of the game, but then also there's only one winner, so... Consider a player like Joey Amazing, Joe Anglim, the guy who destroys just about everyone other than Ozzy when it comes to Challenge Beast stats. Joe has played on three seasons and has reached the merge on every season and has only ever been to a pre-merge tribal council one time. That is not just luck. Joe is an incredible challenge beast who basically carries his tribe to the merge. Joe is the antithesis of the sandbagging strategy, where he does the opposite of playing down his strengths. Joe goes ham to win immunity for his tribe and rewards to win ham every time, and he pretty much always succeeds. And then, to thank him for his efforts and for all the rewards he's won for his tribe, his trimates usually turn on him and vote him out the moment he reaches the merge. Joey Amazing is not so amazing at downplaying how threatening he can be, and thus his reputation comes back to bite him. Going into the immunity challenge, I feel a ton of pressure, but I'm gonna go in there and, and give it all I got and try to get a win. I'm three and oh. Hey, let's make it 4-0. I don't know how many chances there are going to be to get Joe out. Joe is a guy who you give him an inch, he will take a mile. He gets momentum and I'm done. The fact that Joe pushed himself until he passed out 
That is frightening because, like, I can't compete with that. So he's got to go. Joe losing is a great opportunity because if you're playing Survivor and you have a chance to take out Joe, every time is the right time. Conversely, one of my favorite narrative arcs for a three-time player is Colby from season two, eight, and 20. Colby set the record for most individual immunity wins ever all the way back in season two with five wins, a record still unbroken to this day. And so when Colby returned in season 20, he carried with him a reputation of being really good in challenges. Of course, if, if you've seen that season, you would know where I'm going with this. Colby wound up flopping in all of the challenges in season 20 and his reputation from 18 seasons prior as a beast became more like a bust. It became a running gag on the season where Colby was dubbed Superman in a fat suit and he held his head low in shame. However, on the flip side, because Colby had been performing so poorly and been perceived as so weak, he was spared as a target ahead of everyone else on his tribe to the point where he wound up being the last remaining player from the Heroes tribe to get his torch snuffed. A big part of Colby's failed reputation got him all the way to fifth place and was this close just two challenges away from winning the entire season. Even Rupert with a broken toe was voted out ahead of Colby. And you could argue that Colby being bad at challenges and earning a meek reputation created more opportunities for him to win or at least increased his odds. Of course, it does need to be said that Colby wasn't doing any of this intentionally and unfortunately for him, when he reached the final five, he still wasn't able to win a challenge and thus he was voted out. But in a more strategic world, one where Colby was more competent at challenges, like, you know, back in season two, this strategy could have been the difference between being voted out as the merge boot, a la Joy Amazing, or reaching the finale, a la Colby. In season two, Australia, he was the sharp shooting Texas gentleman with a heart of gold. This season, he had a tougher time in challenges. Colby is now the last remaining hero. Can good conquer evil? Hell, I almost convinced myself I was giving up. But I don't know how to quit. It's just not in me. I've never quit anything in my life. So when the time was right, I made one more attempt. And while Colby wasn't much of a strategist here, I do wanna give credit to a myriad of players who have discussed sandbagging as a viable strategy and have pulled it off on the show. One of the best instances is from someone who won the game, Jeremy Collins in season 31, who also played alongside Joe, the guy who was doing the opposite of Jeremy. Going hand in hand with Jeremy's meat shield strategy, the idea of appearing weaker to hide behind perceived stronger players is an added layer of what sandbagging attempts to accomplish. Jeremy was able to do so and use someone like Joe as a shield to be targeted ahead of himself. One of the earliest examples is with Rob Sestronino in the Amazon, where he tries to help his ally, Matt, to understand the concept of not giving every challenger all. Let the other players paint bigger targets on their backs. The advice was lost on Matt, who didn't follow it up until the very last challenge of the season, where Matt threw the challenge and basically assisted in getting Rob voted out. Matt came to me and said, I'm not gonna try my hardest today because I don't want people to think I'm a physical threat. And I said, Matt, I think you're finally starting to understand this game. In season 12, Panama, Austin sandbagged the first individual immunity challenge to get the opposing tribe to target someone else. His plan worked for a single vote. He was voted out in the next episode, but we're gonna count that as a win for Team Sandbag. I don't think I could have beaten Terry in the immunity challenge. So I went in knowing that I was gonna try to make myself look weak. So I was putting on an absolute Oscar winning performance. I was over there falling down and coming back up. That was my plan was to show that I wasn't that strong. And when it comes to another winner, look no further than Chris Underwood, the winner of season 38, who re-entered the game at the final six and tells us he's gonna sandbag at the final six, so he's not targeted right away. I'm so happy that I'm in this game again, but getting back in and kicking it back in just like that, it's not easy. I have to downplay my game, so I'm not perceived as too big of a threat. He then proceeds to throw the next two challenges, even going so far as to openly help Julie beat Rick in a challenge. Chris wasn't even doing the puzzle, it's clear as day. Chris is literally gonna, uh, talking her through this. For your elbow. Very unusual right situation. Right Chris is dead in the water, he's been in the same spot. Tommy on season 39 stated that his entire game was based around the very concept that sandbagging entails. He wanted to lower his threat level right away so he could let others take the fall 
all before him. And while he didn't go on to win a single individual challenge all season, I do very much think he was spared on several occasions because of this strategy. And had he not followed it, had he played more like challenge beasts of yore, perhaps he's not the winner. Many players throughout the years have pulled off sandbagging to varying degrees of success. From Steven and Token Chains to Malcolm in the Philippines, from Eric and Karamoan who only wanted to win reward challenges but purposefully lost immunities so he could help keep his strength up for the late run, to Brenda in the same season who played up her knee injury to erase her reputation from Nicaragua as being a challenge threat. We even saw Tyson do just that when he dislocated his shoulder in Blood vs. Water, using his injury as an excuse to not expend as much energy or to help his tribe win immunities. Nick and Co. Rong hid behind Caleb. Michaela was voted out early in season 33 and changed her tune the following season in Game Changers. Kara and David vs. Goliath used Alec as a shield and Kelly Wentworth on her third attempt, unlike Colby, did her best to not be the best so she could potentially make a deep run. And these are just but a few examples of the strategy that is best kept secret from your peers. Because sandbagging as a concept isn't much of a secret to anyone, but it's also one of those things where uh, by its nature, you don't really want it to get out that you're doing it. At least not until you're at the final tribal, maybe. It's an open secret that anyone could be pulling off, but the kick is that you should also be able to land those beanbags when you get down to the pointy end and it's your neck on the line. Otherwise, you will go the way of Colby, just another Superman in a fat suit. And I should also mention at the very end of the video that this could also apply to your strategic acumen too. Just Downplay your threat level, let others think that you're not as good at the game as you really are, and then turn on the afterburners at the last second. I want everybody to get nice and comfortable with me because their guards are here right now, and they're slowly coming down as they see Tony's around the camp all day, all night. It's coming down like this. And when it gets down to here, hey! That is the secret strategy of sandbagging in Survivor, of playing down your strengths and then turning on the after boosters when you need them most. Because as the saying goes, you can't win Survivor in the first half, so you might as well do what you can to set yourself up to succeed in the second. Control those variables, be the author of your own fate. And of course, let me know what you think about this strategy and any other strats you might want me to talk about in the future. A big thank you to my patrons for authoring your own fates, as well as my own, by supporting me on Patreon. But also, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to win a challenge or two on your way out, and I will see you in the next one once I pull off the opposite approach. Day one, I walk out onto the beaches of Fiji wearing nothing but a muscle suit. Perhaps it was a yearning to go back to a simpler, less complicated time, but there was no denying he was older and more mature. Give me the suit. Give me the suit. I have to wear it all the time. You'd, you'd never understand. I understand more than you'll never know.